friends, welcome to First Presbyterian Church. Great to worship God with you on this beautiful uh, day and the third Sunday of Lent. You know, the journey of life gets hard for all of us. We live with a lot of pressure, a lot of demands at work, at school, just keeping up with life. And every once in a while, it just feels like the temptation is so strong to get distracted or even to do something that could just numb us out. We don't have to feel the, the weight of pressure. Well, here's another, another way to approach the stress and burdens of life, and that's to turn to Christ for strength. He promises a strength beyond ourselves. And I think we also find that as we worship God together here and now. So we're delighted to see you. We welcome you in Jesus' name. If you get a chance, please sign in on the the lectern over there, we've got a sign-in sheet. We ask everyone to do so. We appreciate that. Don't forget that in worship, if you have a prayer request, you can walk over to the table, write out your request, and put it on the clothesline, and our staff will pray for you this week. Next Sunday is a fifth Sunday in March, which means, as we've started doing at First Press, we will gather just once next Sunday at 9.30 in the sanctuary for our fifth Sunday worship service. What we try to do is bring the two congregations together and also to blend styles of worship from both. So you have to come a little bit earlier to the church, but I hope you will. And then afterwards, we've got a great time of fellowship uh, in store for you. So don't forget, next Sunday, 930 in the sanctuary. I want to uh, bring to your attention two retreat opportunities that I hope you might consider and take advantage of. The first is a couples retreat. Uh, that's to be held on the weekend of May 17th through the 19th. And I want to encourage you, if you're married, to seriously think about coming and taking part. To me, this retreat is a chance for you to invest in your marriage. And I don't know if there's many other opportunities that might come your way this year. These brochures can be found in our lobby or go to our website under the events page you can find out all the information and register there. Also in May, at the very end of May, I'm leading a retreat to Holy Cross Monastery in West Park, New York. We uh, go during the week from Tuesday. We come back Friday. At that retreat, we join with the brothers in their monastic life for the week, but we'll also focus on a study that will help, in, uh, help us deepen our spiritual and our prayer lives. These brochures also are found in the lobby or on the events page of our, of our church website. Well, friends, let us prepare to worship God by listening to the law of God. I need to get it, and I'll get it, and I'll come right back, and I'll read it. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Put God first. Worship God only. Use God's name with respect. Remember God's Sabbath. Respect your parents. Do not hurt other people. Be faithful in marriage. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not be envious of others. Having heard God's law, friends, let us now worship God and adore him with our heart and soul and mind and strength. <coughs> Amen. <coughs> this is the Sunday that we invite the kids to come up and do percussion. We have special percussionists that are, that are here. And if you could come up right now. And, uh, and while they're coming, they're ready. And while they're coming, uh, I want to read this scripture. The Lord says from Joel, second chapter, the 13th and the 14th verse says this. Turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in your grief, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Could you stand? Sorry, I'm just putting myself together here. In the name of the Father, in the 
your hidden glory in creation now manifest in you our Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ my King what a beautiful name it is nothing compares to this what a beautiful name it is the name Jesus, you brought heaven down. Sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a wonderful name it is. I 
give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. Sing that with us. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. Here I am. Our service now moves into a time of corporate and private confession. 
And confession can kind of be intimidating for some people. I know it can be intimidating for myself sometimes because when I approach confession, sometimes I like to think, okay, am I just offering a litany of things that I've done wrong for the week, ways I've messed up? I mean, it's really easy for things to come to my mind in confession of how I'm a broken person. And at first this was kind of an act of like self-loathing and shame, but now as I've kind of come to understand confession, it's really quite a relief um, to be able to come to God in the fullness of our humanity, um, bringing our whole selves, brokenness and all, um, to a God who loves you and who meets you with compassion. And so during the season of Lent, we are going through um, prayers of confession that should be on the screen. I'm going to read it aloud, and I invite you to just meditate on this prayer of confession as followed by a time of personal silence prayer. God, we make so many mistakes. We turn away from you so often. We need you so much. Thank you that you so love the world that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross to save us from our sins. Amen. Friends, just like we heard last week with the prodigal son story, it is true that our Heavenly Father meets us with compassion and love and excitement and grace. So know this today. Be assured that in Jesus Christ, you and I are forgiven. In response to this wonderful news, to such a good God that we serve and love, I invite you to stand and share a sign of peace with your neighbor. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you.
Guys and girls, nice to see you all today. I'm so glad that you're here at church. And right behind you is a very good friend of mine named Jean-Luc. You're gonna, he's going to be preaching today, and, and he's going to be telling a story of a time when Jesus was with his friends, and he started preaching, and there were 15,000 people there. Think about that. Have any of you ever been to like a, like a sports, like a Flyers game, or 76ers game, or even a football game? Imagine all those people in this stadium. Huge, right? And they didn't have anything to eat. There were no peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. There were no goldfish crackers to eat. There were no banana slices, no nothing. So what do you think uh, Jesus did? I mean, what would you do if you were there and you saw all these hungry people, 15,000 people, what would you do? Josh, what would you do if you were in that situation? Give them food. Good idea. Now, do you think there was enough food for 15,000? Like, that would be a lot of food. Like, how much food do you think that would be? A lot. Like, probably fill up this room. Maybe two or three rooms. If you had everybody get food and everything else, you know? So Jesus' friends, you know, looked at him and said, Jesus, God, send these people off. You know what Jesus said to them? He said, you feed them. And they did just thought like you did, Josh. But they were like, we don't, we don't know anything about anything. So they started looking for something to, some food. And they found a few fish and a couple rolls. Probably this much food in, like, that could fit in my hand. Not much. But because Jesus is Jesus, he was able to take it, and everybody was filled. And they were so filled, boys and girls, you guys. You know what? Yeah, yeah, that's a great sound. Well, maybe not, don't continue that. That's not so good. Anyway, Jesus blessed it, and there was enough food for everybody. All right, so Jesus is here today, and let's thank him. Will you take your hands, fold them, and let's bow our head, close our eyes, and let's pray. You pray after me. Dear Jesus, we love you. Thank you for all you can do through us. Use us, Jesus. We love you. Amen. All right, you guys go back to your seats. Not going to be stepped on by your pastor. That's not a good thing. <laughs> We're about to pray, and I uh, want you to be aware of prayer requests that uh, we'll share with each other in a second. But let me start with letters of well-wishing. Uh, Jack Sununu, beloved member of our church, recently celebrated his 95th birthday. And so if you get a chance... Is Jack here? He's not here, is he? Oh, where's clapping for? Well, that's good. Uh, if you get a chance to say hi to Jack or send him a card, please do so. Celebrating with Andrew Heller and Tara Kaiser, who recently became engaged. So happy news for their family. Also, we received news this week uh, from the Leffords. Roger and Beth became grandparents this week. And uh, they are now the proud grandparents of a grandson, Beckett Arthur Lefford, born to Johnny and Brianne out in Seattle, Washington. So the Leffords are like on cloud nine, uh, really excited. Just before worship, our first worship service, we learned that Nancy McIntyre passed away last night. Uh, we learned from her sister Helen. No word on arrangements yet, but uh, please pray for Nancy McIntyre's family as they grieve her death. Are there any other joys or concerns that you'd like to share with us today? What a gift to be with God's people, to share our joys, to encourage us, to pray for each other that we can carry one another's burdens. Any joys, any concerns? Yeah. Okay. Praying for Barbara Lou Casey, whose uh, husband Steve died recently. We'll be keeping them in prayer. Well, let's pray together as God's people. Will you join me in prayer? Lord God, we thank you for this time and this place and the, these people you have surrounded us with. Lord, it is uh, indescribably wonderful to be here 
And Lord, we realize that we've come from all kinds of places this week. Some of us, Lord, have had the very best week. Some of us have had absolutely horrible weeks. But we thank you, Lord, that you're here for us all the same. That you're here, Lord, to carry our burdens. You're here to forgive us of sin. You're here to give us hope. And so, Lord, I pray for myself and for my friends today that we would be finding in you what we desperately need. We thank you that you're sufficient. We thank you, Lord, that you're always bigger than anything that we're facing. Lord, we rejoice today with so much good news. We thank you for Jack, for his life, for the legacy of his life. We thank you, Lord, for the birth of grandchildren. We thank you for those who have recently become engaged. We also pray for these families, Lord, who have recently lost loved ones. Now, Lord, they adjust to life without someone. Now they grieve. And, Lord, we know that you are near to those who are brokenhearted. Lord, we pray for our nation in these demanding times that we're in. We pray for other parts of the world. I especially pray for the country of Mexico and the city of Mexico City where my friend John Luke served so faithfully. We ask, Lord, that you would be at work in that land. And now, Lord, we offer these prayers to you and together in Jesus' name and for his sake, for he is the one who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just before we receive today's offering, I want you to meet one of my dear friends, Jean-Luc Craig. Jean-Luc is here today to preach. He uh, was born and raised in the Ivory Coast of West Africa and is of Swiss German, uh, of Swiss German family. Jean-Luc is the founder and general director of Urban uh, uh, Mosaic. Uh, a wonderfully amazing mission um, in Mexico and other parts of uh, Latin America. I have uh, spent time with Jean-Luc in Mexico individually, but also with the missions team. And the work that he's doing among some of the very poorest in Mexico City, he's bringing them hope by sharing the gospel, planting churches, <coughs> but he's also providing any number of other services in partnership with Mexican leadership. I'm delighted that he is here today, and I hope you will have the chance to meet him and get to know him. In the lobby, um, you'll find these uh, wonderful reports of their work from this past year, and I'd encourage you to take it and get a sense of this exciting thing that God is doing. So at this time, let us continue to worship God as our ushers come to receive our morning offering. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretched treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Yeah. 
Good morning, church. It's good to be with you this morning. Thank you, Stuart, for the invitation. And uh, it's good to get to know uh, Morse Tom Presbyterian Church and uh, celebrate this mon Sunday morning worship service with you and establish a friendship that maybe will go over many years. So I'm really grateful to be here and uh, meet with you in person. So as you've heard, I'm uh, Jean-Luc and uh, the uh, founder and uh, director of Urban Mosaic in Mexico City and now in Colombia and in the future in other places. So uh, I'll share a little bit more about that in this service, in this sermon, and after, be very glad to meet with you in person. Um, the scripture for this morning uh, comes from uh, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 through 44, and I'll read it from the New Living Translation. Uh, the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all that they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there are so many people coming that Jesus and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and they saw them leaving. And so people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began teaching them many things. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Uh, send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. But Jesus said, you feed them. With what, they asked. Uh, we have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. How much bread do you have, he asked. Go and find out. So they came back and they reported and said, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. So Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. And so they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. And Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked upwards towards heaven and he blessed them. And then breaking the loaves into pieces. He kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. And they all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. This is the word of the Lord. You know, before I started Mosaic, uh, in my former work, I worked as a consultant for the Philanthropy Foundation, actually here in, in Philadelphia. And uh, so I traveled a lot to countries in, in Latin America and Asia and partially Africa to investigate different kinds of projects, ministries, organizations, and do due diligence on them uh, to, to present them then to investors, uh, uh, donors, uh, philanthropists, and so forth, to give them the confidence to actually uh, give to those organizations. Uh, as I did that, I came across uh, many different ministries who are doing tremendous work. Uh, I met ministries who were rescuing sex slaves in Ecuador, uh, temple prostitutes in India, uh, others that did agricultural development in, in uh, Peru uh, to help destitute Peruvian farmers that were hurt by the shining path terror from not having to leave their campos, but actually in the not having to go to the urban slums in Lima. Uh, I saw um, uh, organizations providing microcredits to single mothers in Nairobi slum, so those mothers could feed their children, wouldn't have to prostitute themselves. Uh, doing anti-domestic violence campaigns, others organizations helping victims of sexual abuse in Managua and Nicaragua. Uh, some very wonderful ministries that worked actually with Dalit women, the, the women that were in the lowest caste in India, and these women went out and they planted churches, hundreds, thousands of churches in Uttar Pradesh, which uh, nor normally is considered the, the, the graveyard of missionaries in India. 
Others, they were running internet cafes in Yemen to reach young Muslim men with the gospel. Others, they were providing crisis counseling to raped victims of the Liberian war. Those that were providing home-based care to AIDS victims in Zambia so they wouldn't just be able to live with dignity, some of them actually die with dignity. Training Chinese house church leaders to reach unreached people groups, not just inside China, but actually outside China. Uh, the list could go on of so many different types of organizations, ministries that were doing wonderful work. And what it did to me personally showed me that God indeed is doing a wonderful thing in this world. And, and I have actually more hope today that God is alive, that God is building his kingdom, that God has not abandoned us, that God has not forgotten us his people. A and you know, the great miracle and the great mystery in all of this is that God has called you and that he has called me to be part of what he's doing in history. At the same time, of course, as I saw these wonderful ministries, I did also come across mediocre organizations, ministries, churches, uh, ministries that could have done much better brought more fruit, made greater impact, changed more lives. So I saw many churches, leaders, ministries, Christians willing to stop before much fruit, settling for something much m smaller that God maybe had in mind for them. And so I started wondering, well, what's the difference between these two types of ministries, those that are really fruitful and those that are not so fruitful? those that made a significant impact and those that did not. Uh, what I came to realize is that those ministries that really made a difference in this world, those were ministries that I come to realize that faithfulness not simply only meant obedience. It not simply only meant doing what was required. They came to realize that they were part of God's plan to bring redemption to their surroundings. They came to realize that God wanted to use them, that God wanted them to have high expectations of God. They came to realize that they were called to faithfulness and fruitfulness. And the most that I saw, these ministries were actually consumed with a passion for the world and for its people. They, in many ways, I would say, internalized the teachings that we find in Mark chapter 6, verses 30 through 44, because they came to realize what God's heart was beating for. So as we go to the text, we see that the disciples had just undergone a very thrilling experience on their third proclamation tour through Galilee. Uh, Jesus had sent them out in pairs of two to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. And as they did so, as they went to the villages, to the little cities around, uh, they, they drove out demons, they anointed sick people with oil, and people actually got healed and saved and liberated. And this must have been an exciting experience for the disciples. They were able to work in the anointing of the power of the Holy Spirit, and great things got done in the name of Jesus. I mean, they came back with a lot of enthusiasm to what they had just experienced. Unfortunately, their thrilling experience quite quickly was chilled, because they also vividly saw the cost that their actions could have proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God sometimes provokes counter reactions. And they saw that very vividly when they heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded. Josephus, he's a Jewish aristocrat, a historian. He wrote uh, a, a number of uh, things about the history of the Jews during that time. He actually says about John the following. He says, John, he was a good man, and he exhorted the Jews to lead righteous lives, practice justice towards one another, and piety towards God, and so join him in baptism. When many others joined the crowds about him, for they were greatly moved on hearing his words, Herod feared 
that John's great influence over the people would lead to a rebellion. So Herod decided, therefore, that it was much better to strike first and be rid of him before his work led to an uprising. Accordingly, John was sent as a prisoner to a fortress because of Herod's suspicious temper and was there put to death. So that's what Josephus writes about John. John was killed for defending justice, for prophetically challenging the power that be in this case Herod, holding him accountable for his unjust actions and also for his perverted values. Now that takes courage. That takes guts. And it provoked suffering and a huge cost to the life of John. Jo following God, standing up for his justice, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, it's costly, and it does invoke suffering. And so after a time of thrilling experience in ministry, the disciples came back again with Jesus. I'm sure there were mixed emotions. On the one hand, they're happy, thrilled. On the other hand, maybe tired, frightened. Not knowing, will following Jesus actually mean that like John, we'll have to suffer too one day? So Jesus told him, well, you know what, let's go away. Let's have some time of rest. Let's just process this together. And so Jesus took them away to the other side of the lake. But when they arrived at their place of retreat, there was a multitude of people waiting for them. And as Jesus saw this multitude of people, he was overcome with emotion. As Jesus saw the crowds, and he had compassion on them. His heart broke at the sight of them. Jesus knew the pain, the anger that God had regarding the shepherds of Israel. As we see in Ezekiel 4, which is kind of a parallel passage to all of this, we see that God is denouncing the shepherds of Israel. And so Jesus, while he had compassion on the crowds, in great part because he saw that the Jewish political, economic, civic, and religious leaders who should have been the shepherds of the nation had instead become a pack of wolves, thieves, who like hirelings, exploited the flock, oppressed them, instead of serving them and helping them to flourish. Actually, all these leaders, whether civic, political, religious, etc., all they were really interested in was controlling the people, upholding the status quo. Instead, Jesus saw the crowds, and as he looked at them, he saw them that they were like sheep whose shepherds had to turn into wolves without identity, without purpose, harassed, helpless, sheep in need of deliverance of the wolves, as oppressed per people who are weary and burdened, who also needed rest. He was moved enough as he saw that to cry, outraged enough to contend, concerned enough to identify himself with them fully, and this really is compassionate service. You know, without feeling broken by what breaks God's heart, without feeling passion the way God feels passion for this world, honestly, uh, we, we really won't be able to be effective ministers and contribute to the expansion of God's kingdom. I see that so often in my own life. As I look around, I see this overwhelming need. And I ask myself, is my heart broken by what breaks God's heart? God's heart? Am I passionate by what God is passionate about? Or have I limited God's passion only to a very little aspect of God's entire mission? You know, it's a question that this passage challenges us to think of and think about. What answers would you come up with? If other people looked at your life would they found I find out what God is really passionate about? So with this kind of compassion, with this kind of love, Jesus begins to preach. 
and he preaches for quite a while. I mean, he has authority in his words. It, it, people like to listen to him. And he goes on talking about the kingdom. And he goes on and on and on. And finally, the disciples come to him and say, Jesus, I mean, I think this was enough, right? I mean, you preached long enough, right? And so they interrupted him and tell him, look, send the people away because to the surrounding towns because we have nothing to give them to eat. But here's something that Jesus does now that is very fascinating. Jesus actually wants to move the disciples a step beyond being enthralled with the power that they received of healing people and casting out demons. Now, the disciples actually had tasted the power of the Spirit, but they had not really known the heart of the Spirit yet. Instead, Jesus actually wanted to awaken in them a vision an understanding for God's heart, not just for some individuals, but God's heart for the entire nation. He wanted them to be moved by people's needs. He wanted them to be moved by their pain. And he wanted to be moved by seeing how God actually wanted to use them to address the needs in their nation, to lay down their hearts, their lives, what we just sang, the little they had, so God could use it he wanted his disciples to be ta begin taking responsibilities and leadership as true shepherds for a nation where there were many sheep without shepherds. So instead of acquiescing to their suggestion that he send people away, he tells them something very poignant. He says, you give them to eat. You give them to eat. A and right there, a, a kind of fascinating, interesting ping pong game between God and his disciples begins, right? Because uh, this doesn't really land well with the disciples. And so they come back to him and push back and say, well, you know, Jesus, I mean, we don't have that kind of money. I mean, you know, what, what it would take would be almost equal to one year's salary. I mean, do you really want us to go out of our way and waste this money, all this money, to give to these people to eat? Come on now, Jesus, I mean, you taught us about stewardship, right? And so with these words, they hit back the ping-pong ball to Jesus' court. Uh, you know, when Jesus, the disciples perceived the magnitude of the need, and when they looked at their own resources, one thing became abundantly clear to them. We can't do what Jesus is asking of us. Impossible. I, that's how often I feel when I look at the needs so overwhelming in our world. It is completely impossible to think about even starting to address them. I mean, right now, one in five people on planet Earth live in an urban poor community. In uh, 2030, it'll be one in four. By 2050, according to projections, one in 2.5 people on planet Earth will be living in an urban poor community. Now, that causes a lot of fragility in many of these cities that take off all these migrants and, and they can't really provide everything that is needed for the people coming into the cities. That fragility creates unrest. It creates uh, people who are angry at what they can't have. That produces violence. And we see that violence then flashing itself out by people fleeing that violence and moving away from those cities in search for safer harbors. It produces mass migration. And as a result, we now have all these other policies that don't even know how to deal with that mass migration. And as I look at this overwhelming need, I wonder, what can we actually do? Where do we invest? How do we go about it? It seems impossible. And this is the question the disciples had. You know, yet Jesus, he doesn't stay with a ball. But with a great shot, he brings back to the disciples' court. It's okay, okay, but what do you have? What do you have? Go and see. So they went around looking, and finally came back and said, well, five loaves of bread and two fish. I can imagine Peter just entering at this point and saying, you know, geez, I have my own fishing business. I know how to do math, right? I'm counting this thing, right? These two fish and these five bread, that definitely won't be enough for all these people, and you know that. What's happening to you, Jesus? You know, the disciples had experienced 
some miracles. They'd healed some sick people. They'd cast out some demons. They'd seen the power of God work through them, and not just through Jesus. And, and they were actually thrilled and excited about the little impact that they had had. Yet, those miracles were not humongous. I mean, they, they, they healed a few people, maybe a couple of dozen. But this was larger. And this was big. I mean, 5,000 men plus women plus children, 15, 20,000 people. This was beyond. I mean, they'd been okay with being used by God to have small impact, but such large impact? I often say this to my Pentecostal and charismatic friends uh, who I work with a lot, who are very, very, very enthralled by, hey, we just healed a sick person. I was like, wonderful. Let's give glory to God about that. But what about the other thousands and millions of sick people out there? Well, maybe that's a little too big. So Jesus comes back to the disciples and as they bring these two fish and five breads to him, he says, well, what you have, will you give it to me? What you have, will you give it to me? Finally, the disciples took responsibility to be obedient and to give what they had. And once they brought it to Jesus, then Jesus took the responsibility to do the miracle. And this is how God works. He always works in cooperation with us. He always works together with us. And he just asks us for the little bit that we have so that he can do a miracle. And then Jesus prayed. He broke the bread and he asked the disciples to distribute it. And God is a generous God. And finally, there were 12 baskets full of leftovers. At this point, I'd love to invite you just to think, do a little mental experiment. Just like to think that, you know, as Jesus was breaking the bread and giving it to the disciples, the disciples just starting to see this miracle and becoming overwhelmed, say, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God, for all these abundant blessings that you give us, all the while never passing along the fish and the bread to the other people. Just bear with me a little bit with this little thought experiment, right? And so you see the mounting piles of food, and you even maybe start seeing the disciples complaining to Jesus, well, and what are you doing about all these hungry multitudes? You know, many Christians and churches all over the world, you know, we often say to God, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the power, for the protection, that you, for the goodness that you've granted us, right? Sparing us from poverty, from injustice, from deep struggles. Thank you, God. Praise to God. And that's where we leave it. Or we can ask, what have you given me, Father, that I might help those who don't have power, who don't have protection, who don't have freedom, who don't have justice. And respond to the question of God, what you have, will you give it to me? Now, this teaching really has become alive in our ministry in Urban Mosaic in so many different ways. And sometimes I actually am speechless myself, and I'm overwhelmed by what God does with the little that we bring to him. And not just us, the people we work with, the very, very urban poor as we involve them in their own development. And all of a sudden, it starts multiplying. A, a clear example of that I saw about a year and a half ago. You might still be aware of that. We had two major earthquakes hit Mexico in September of 2017. And while as an organization we do many things, we do church planting, we equip leaders, we do community development, community organizing, advocacy, health development, youth, children, we're not a disaster relief agency. That's, that's not what we're about, right? But as we saw the reality of the need around us, we simply were like, we cannot look the other way. We have to do something. And so we said, well, Let's just do what we normally do. Let's not invent another process. Let's just do what we're good at. And we had a little less than $1,000 in our emergency fund, which is not very big. Um, and so we said, let's, let's just see where we go with this. And so we went to one of the cities that had been hard hit by the earthquake. 
And as we went there, I met with a pastor, and the pastor started to kind of show us around. And we did what we always do. We started by listening, not by doing. And so I asked the pastor, do you know some city official that we can meet with? And so he presented me to one of the city officials. And so we met with the city official, and we just uh, presented ourselves, and look, we're this nonprofit organization doing these things. We don't have any idea of what the best way would be for us to intervene. What do you think? In what ways could we serve best here? And so the city official came back with a very interesting proposal, and he said, you know, please do not bring any blankets, please do not bring any food, please do not bring water, we don't need those things, but what I really need is heavy machinery because we're very scared that any aftershock pr pr could provoke more damage to the buildings and those that are still standing could come down on others. So if you could help us bring heavy machinery in to demolish homes, we'd love your help. He took down his number, and I, I never know if I'm ever gonna see you again, but we'll think about it. I left that meeting and I was like, how the heck are we going to respond to this? <laughs> I mean, honestly, I had to look up Google Maps where this place was. <laughs> I didn't know anybody there, less people with a, a business that owned heavy machinery. And that could have been the end of it. We would have simply said, okay, that goes beyond our means. That's not our mission. That's not what we're about. I don't have any heavy machinery, nor do I know anybody. Let's just leave it at that. Thank you, God. But we said, let's simply try to do one thing. And we started with what we had. And what we had was a car, two pairs of eyes, and a less than $1,000 in our pocket, which doesn't go very far to demolish homes. So we did a little tour through the city. And as we did that tour, after about an hour, we saw this backhoe sitting by the side of the road. And so we went and talked with the machinist, and so the machinist brought the business owner out, and the business owner said to us, we presented what we were about, and we're like, w would you be interested in working together because there's a real need here? And so the business owner said to us, you know what? I'm actually a business owner from this city. I would love to help my people. I've been out here actually since three o'clock trying to do something, but I can't do anything. The municipality is in this way. Nobody gives me permits. Nobody knows anybody. And I can just start pulling down homes because I may have liability issues. So if you can help me get the paperwork straight, I'd be glad to work with you. So we call up Luis from the city and we say, Luis, you remember we were with us with you an hour ago? Um, we have your first machine. However, now you have to cut the red tape and you have to follow through and be co-responsible on your side. And if we see you do that, we'll see what more we can do. Effectively, Luis showed up a half an hour later and within the hour, that machine was working. We negotiated with the municipality to pay the diesel for that machine. And so for about a week, that machine was working and it didn't cost us a dollar. Next, we started to look with some other friends. We didn't have much. We just started asking some friends, hey, why don't we pool resources together instead of us all doing our little things over there, let's just do something together. And so we brought a little bit more money together, about $3,000, not very much. We negotiated with a machine enterprise that lived, was about an hour away, and we told the guy, okay, how much does this go for? He's like, well, with this amount of money, you can have the machines for three days, three machines. He's like, okay, we're giving a lot, you're gonna put in something as well, so you're gonna put in an extra day. And then he said, okay, because this is a national catastrophe, Catastrophe. Finally, the machinists came and we said, okay, machinists, you know, all this is happening. Would you be willing to work 12-hour shifts instead of eight-hour shifts? And we'll feed you and make sure you have everything. Long story short, this went on. After two weeks, 207 homes had been torn down and demolished. That saved the community about $335,000 in demolition costs. Then we started working with local churches, bringing them together and saying, we can't really provide all the aftercare and trauma recovery care that's needed. So we started training local churches. And together with them, we provided uh, psychological first aid and crisis counseling to people. And actually, when it was beautiful, when the homes were torn down of the people, we had people standing them right by their side. And it was, one, it just, it was touching to see grown men cry, break down, because here, everything they had was broken down. We were there to accompany them in their time of need, providing hope, moral support. 
more things happen. By now we've rebuilt over Haiti homes. And it started with less than $1,000. It was a real example of what Jesus is teaching us here. What you have, will you give it to? You know, that brings me to this conclusion, to just see that you and I, we are actually God's plan for making goodness visible and tangible. You and I, we are God's plan for making his justice come alive, for defending the weak. You and I, we are God's plan to sow seeds of hope among the oppressed and the depressed. You and I, we are God's plan to sow hope, to heal hurt, to come alongside broken people. You and I, we are part of God's plan to show to a world that God does indeed care, that God has not abandoned us, that God's plan is still wide alive, that God is a God of love and of justice. You and I, we are God's plan, not just to be healers of some individuals, but to be shepherds in a nation, in a world of sheep that have no shepherds. So this is my prayer. This is my longing, that in a world of much hurt and much suffering and need, that God will rescue us as he rescued the disciples from their fear to move us with courage into a world of need, that he will make us one of those effective, fruitful ministries that bring out much positive change in this world because we've internalized the teachings of Mark 6, verses 30 through 44, that we've internalized that God's question to us is, what do you have? What you have? Will you give it to me? Will you be shepherds in a nation where there's many sheep without shepherds?
So friends, we are continuing with our ways, um, and if you turn to the back of your card, you'll notice that we are on way at number 11, and that says, make others at home here. Let me read it for you really quick. It says, warmly welcome newcomers and visitors. Offer your name with a smile. Reach out and greet the person maybe you don't know after worship or during coffee hour, youth group or Sunday school. It says, show 